I would like to thank uh, the Academy for inviting me out here. Um, and, I, and, and I hope as I go through this talk, you'll understand the relationship uh, between um, the Apostolic Institute in Peru and in, uh, in New Spain, and in particular, uh, as we talk about uh, California, um, and dealing with uh, issues with the state. Uh, uh, and I think Jeff's talk this morning, especially, uh, is going to uh, it's going to go well with with what I'm talking about and how uh, Father Serra uh, struggled to deal with some issues of of uh, governance in Spanish America. So. Peruvian Viceroy Manuel de Amat once quipped that the Patronato Real or the Royal Patronage or Patronato Regio, depending what language you're using, uh, is the, quote, most precious and resplendent jewel of the Spanish Empire. The Patronato has its origins in, medi in the medieval period in the wake of the collapse of the Roman Empire uh, when the papacy gave many of the crowns of Europe certain privileges within the church. Most notably, it gave monarchs the authority to nominate bishops and collect tithes. In many respects, this practice uh, was to improve the efficiency of church governance within Christendom as travel to and from Rome became hampered as Roman infrastructure dec decayed and as Christian unity faltered, making timely administration more difficult. The Spanish Patronato began during the 15th century as the crowns of Castile and Aragon along with Portugal, started their final push against the Islamic Moorish states that inhabited the peninsula for more than 700 years. With the discovery of the New World, the church only allowed the powers of the Patronato to strengthen, both as a reward for evangelizing the New World, but also as recognition that Rome could not directly govern the church in such a far-flung empire. While the Spanish Patronato has been seen as the result of a weakened papacy in the face of Spanish dominance, like its medieval predecessor, it was a practical approach to running a global church. Furthermore, it gave Spain stake in the fate of the church, both politically and financially, therefore strengthening Spain's desire for evangelization efforts. As Bourbon bureaucrats started, starting in the dawn of the 18th century, began attempts to reform what they saw as a decaying empire, the Patronato Real became one of the most important targets, hence the quote by Manuel de Amat, as reformers sought to strengthen their hold over Spain's vast colonial territory, many saw the church as an impediment to state control. As one of the principal non-governmental institutions in the New World, the church had amassed great power and prestige. While reformers did not want to rid the empire of the church, they wanted to subordinate it more to state authority. Since the Patronato had, had been the traditional vehicle for state power over the church, Reformers therefore sought to extend, extend its authority. In 1737 and again in 1753, the papacy and the crown signed concordats that gave the monarchy increased power over the Spanish church, including the right to name offices other than bishops. The Pope, however, refused to grant the crown what they wanted, which was called a patronato universal, or universal patronage, uh, which would essentially cede his last remaining powers over the secular clergy to the crown. The emergence of the College of the Propaganda Fide in the late 17th century and 18th centuries therefore set up an interesting conflict between the desires of the crown to maintain control of the church under the auspices of the Patronato and the overall efficient and effective governance of its territories. The Patronato already had its limits in the Americas. While it effectively gave crown control over bishops and other secular offices, bishops did not have direct power over the vast numbers of regular clergy who flocked to the New World. In truth, bishops did have some power, of course, over the regular clergy. While bishops could not interfere with the internal workings of convents and monasteries, they did retain the power to issue or not licenses to perform mass and other sacraments. As the regular clergy controlled many of the parishes and missions of the Americas, they therefore needed the bishop's permission to exert the full powers of the church. Additionally, bishops performed confirmations and ultimately retained the privilege of ordaining priests to service these very parishes. In the frontiers, these powers, as uh, David talked about, uh, were further diminished. Uh, the distance from the Episcopal seat generally required the creation of a prefect, as we just heard about, uh, which was endowed with many powers of a bishop. Um, with the emergence of the Bourbon reform and its attempt to increase control of the Americas, the apostolic colleges, de propaganda fide, therefore seemed to be 
uh, to present the crown with an interesting dilemma. While as part of the reform, the crown worked to strip the regular clergy of power, seeing them as, a com uh, as completely outside the power of the state and the patronato, the discipline, efficiency, and more importantly, peninsular origin of the apostolic missionaries made them want to support them. This conflict between ideology and practicality created, at least in the case of Santa Rosa de Acopa, um, which is near uh, Huancayo, Peru, or Jauja, Peru, kind of in between those two cities, um, it, it, it created a mixed response towards the missionaries and the tendency to try to co-opt the college rather than extinguish it as they had done uh, with other institutions, particularly the, the Jesuits. Ultimately, it seems that the Bourbon officials' response depended on geography. From Spain, the colleges looked as ideal institutions helping to expand the borders of the empire. From the perspective of the viceroys, uh, who actually did carry the title of the vice patron of the patronato, uh, their size and influence seemed uh, less benign. Slowly over the 18th century and early 19th century, the crown used the patronato to take control of the college, resulting arguably in their very ruin. In the early years of Acopa, uh, 1708 to 1742, conflicts over the college and its missions played out in contradictory ways. Early on, the missions were successful at obtaining, or, the, or Copa, the Copa missions were successful at obtaining financial concessions from bureaucrats in Madrid. In a way, these donations can be seen as an extension of the patronato as the crown patronized and thereby exerted some control over evangelical activities in the distant colonial frontiers. In 1718, for example, the crown promised a Copa an annual stipend of 6,000 pesos per a year and uh, in 1730, 1737, and 1751 to 52, paid for the transport of groups of peninsular friars to Spain, from Spain to Peru. On paper, this was quite astounding. In a review of accounts in 1773, a Copa's royal stipend was nearly six times larger than what any other Franciscan community in Peru received and constituted almost half of all donations from the crown in the viceroyalty to the order. However, the viceregal authorities, uh, to, to the viceregal authorities, Acopa seemingly represented a greater threat to their power. For example, they only paid the friars eight times between 1718 and 1750, and only once did they pay the full amount. They, however, did little to directly criticize Acopa, most likely nervous at attacking a well-connected organization. Authorities in Madrid disagreed with the viceroy, viceregal authorities' failure to pay and at the insistence of a Copa, the 1718 royal decree given to crown, given, giving a Copa crown funding was reissued twice in 1729 and in 1734. Uh, oh, I always do this. I, I skip my slides, so. There we go. Those are on slide three. Okay. The, uh, the Juan Santos Atahualpa, uh, Atahualpa Rebellion, and if you want to know more about the rebellion and the friar's response to it, I recommend seeing my article in the Americas, which just came out a few days ago. Uh, but this talk is not about that. I'm going to kind of skim over that. Uh, so anyway, the rebellion, uh, however, seemed to open up uh, a copa to uh, more serious criticisms. Uh, beginning in 1742, the rebels overran the vast majority of a copa's mission stations in the central montaña, leaving them with only two. Some reformers saw this moment as an opportunity to show a copa to be just as corrupt and superfluous as the other regular institutions were frequently accused of being. Furthermore, among, the most, uh, uh, among them was the most famous uh, uh, critics or projectistas, uh, Jorge Juan and Antonio de Ulloa, who condemned a copa as having wasted 40 years on, quote, reducing a group of Indians of only two, a group, reducing a group of only 2,000 Indians. And having, and he also accused them of having caused the Juan Santos Atahualpa Rebellion in the first place by treating the natives, quote, so cruelly and contemptuously. Uh, while little came from these accusations from their beneficiaries in Madrid, the rising anti-Copa atmosphere gave the Viceroy Jose Antonio Manso Velasco, the newly dubbed Count of Superunda, political cover sufficient to cut their funding in half and bar the missionaries from re-entering the area lost to Juan Santos. This more openly hostile position toward a Copa did not last. When Charles III came to the throne in 1759, a Copa was able to take advantage of perhaps his more Franciscan pro-Franciscan tendencies 
and lobby for not only a restitution of their stipend, but an increase. The missionaries were able to slowly shift their rhetoric to reflect the crown's new ideas about their role as the royal patron of the church. In 1756, the, the guardian of Acopa stated in a letter to Viceroy Manso de Lasco that, quote, the main object of our missionaries coming from the kingdom of Spain is to serve both majesties, the divine in the conversion of souls of the infidels and the human in the greatest increase of his vassals and domains. The missionaries also established a permanent apoderado, like an empowered individual, or friar in this case. Uh, the apoderado was a member of the college that resided at court in Madrid, who not only lobbied for a copa, but spent most of his time recruiting friars for the service in the missions. And he, in fact, had a stipend, a quite generous stipend to do this. Therefore, with excellent representation at court and the use of the prefect in their missions, there was little uh, the vice regal authorities could do to control the college through the patronato. This autonomy, however, began to diminish in the 1870s, but not as a result of increasing pressures from reformers to control the college, but because of a philosophical change from within a copa. Much of this conflict has been centered on one friar, Fra Francisco Aures de Villanueva. As one copa missionary would later vent, quote, frankly hell has not spit out an equal monster, nor instrument perfectly suited to the destruction of the college, as Fray Francisco Alvarez of Villanueva. Wasn't holding back on that one. However, while you could perhaps see uh, Alvarez of Villanueva uh, as, as this reformer and great crusader for the patronato as a form of state control, uh, the truth is more complicated. And, 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 and I was talking yesterday uh, to somebody about this that uh, I believe he saw himself as uh, doing a good thing for the missionary work. Uh, and, and you'll see this as I go on here. Uh, well, perhaps some in the college disliked him, obviously, from that quote. Uh, when he first arrived from Peru, many of the Copa's leadership, including the guardian friar Francisco de San Jose, uh, praised his talents. Not really as a missionary. He, was never, he never really served in the frontier, but as an effective advocate for a Copa. He was immediately made a Copa's procurador, uh, which was in charge of kind of getting alms and helping kind of make the state do what it was supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, in Lima, and so he never actually went up to Acopa. And in, in, in 1775, Acopa actually sent him back to Spain as uh, the newly uh, anointed apoderado to collect a new group of missionaries and to escort them back. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there's Charles III. Okay. All right. We'll get to this. Um, although Alvarez was only given license to recruit missionaries, while in Madrid, he advocated for a new project for Acopa. He argued that instead of spending resources on reclaiming the territory lost to Juan Santos, which they were somewhat obsessed with, uh, known as the Chanchamayo Plan, it's named for uh, this river right here, and there, this is the area that was lost to Juan Santos, kind of this area right here. Um, a copa should aid in the construction of a road from their mission in Pazuzu, which is well up here, uh, to the port of Myra, where it was possible to navigate to the Ucayale, which is further above this map, uh, and ultimately the Amazon River. Uh, Alvarez went to Great Lakes to emphasize the commercial benefit of this enterprise as well. The new port, he claimed, would be an entrepot for Amazonian products, listing no less than 22 potential trade goods, including, quote, gold, sugar, chocolate, cinnamon, Jesuit's bark for making quinine, uh, rice, beans, yucca, and yams. Uh, the plan won approval from both the court officials in Madrid and the vice regal authorities in Lima, and ultimately, it was attempted uh, unsuccessfully. Additionally, uh, an expedition to re-enter the area lost to Juan Santos was also attempted uh, and also ended in failure. These two contrasting plans, however, underline two distinct philosoph philosophical visions of evangelization. One was missionary-led, focused on salvation, uh, which did actually end in two massive rebellions in this area. It was one of the main criticisms of it. Uh, and the other was evangelization as a byproduct of cultural and commercial interactions, or perhaps we can call them impositions. Um, this, this later model was known uh, by vice regal authorities as, quote, the new method of spiritual governance, uh, which I'd like to note that it seems that uh, Junipero Serra fought tooth and nail during his time there. 
Uh, and this was, they, which sought, it, it sought Hispanization uh, and conversion through trade. Uh, as the Amerindians interacted economically with colonial populations, proponents argued, they would begin to adopt Hispanic cultural values, including Christianity. The appeal of the system to the crown was obvious because it would no longer have to invest in frontier missions while reaping the taxes that the new commerce would produce. When the, quote, new method was initially attempted in northern Mexico, it was almost done completely without the support of religious orders, using military forces and colonists to, quote, pacify uh, new regions, with the friars along to baptize those who would convert. By the way, it was essentially kind of a genocide. <laughs> um, However, the method was impractical, since the reason most frontier areas were still frontiers was that the Spanish officials often struggled to get uh, a sufficient number of colonists to settle them. Other concepts within the new method nonetheless remained, particularly the idea of evangelization through infrastructure improvement and ultimately leading to commercialization. So for COPA, uh, this didn't debate didn't, uh, didn't end. It, it actually was renewed in 1785 when Alvarez returned with a new group of missionaries. So you have kind of these two competing ideas that missionaries first go out there, uh, and this had had some problems in Acopa because of these rebellions, uh, but then this kind of the, the new method. So Alvarez returns with 42 missionaries, uh, along with having the privilege to handpick them, and in, in a, delay, a delay for almost a year in Cadiz gave him time to know the college's newest members. In contrast to earlier groups who were mostly Castilians, Exactly half were from the Kingdom of Aragon. Though Alvarez himself of the Castilian, this group and the 15 or so members that would later rally around and became known in the College of Acopa as the Aragonese faction. Uh, shortly after arriving in Lima, Alvarez met the Viceroy to convince him that the Viceroy, as Vice Patron of the Patronato in Peru, uh, and not the guardian of Acopa, Maricia Gallardo, should choose where the new missionaries were to be assigned. Alvarez then presented a plan of where the viceroy should send the missionaries. So he's kind of trying to usurp the guardian's powers. Alvarez, uh, he explained that since he'd gotten to know the personalities and abilities of each missionaries during the long wait in Spain uh, and their journey to Peru, that he might be better suited than the guardian to advise the viceroy on the matter. Uh, adding that in September 1783, the commissary general of the Indies back in Spain had given him permission to do so, quote, in order to repair the concept of the college that was close to expiring, though Alvarez was never able to produce any document that sustained this claim. Such a proposal overstepped the traditional extent of the patronato as it placed the viceroy over the internal workings of a copa. Alvarez's proposal, however, must have struck a chord with the viceroy, not only arguing for the supremacy of the crown, even in internal religious matters, but also offering himself as an agent for extending viceregal control to one of the most powerful Franciscan institutions in Peru. The viceroy, of course, approved the plan. After initially resisting, Gallardo eventually capitulated and allowed the plan to go forward. However, the conflict did not then end there. Alvarez then confronted Gallardo, claiming that his election as guardian was invalid. Over the next few years, accusations flew as each side tried to demonstrate the illegitimacy of the other. At one point, Alvarez's followers, the so-called Aragonese faction, attempted to steal the seal of a copa, preventing Gallardo from issuing orders to the missionaries in the far-off jungle. While Gallardo's supporters accused the Aragonese faction of trying to poison the guardian, claiming that, quote, even though I did not see the poison poured, it is public knowledge, end of quote. The vitriol expressed by both sides finally came to a head in the beginning of 1787, when Gallardo's three-year term as guardian expired. As the election was called, the man chosen to preside over them, a friar Andres Carvajal from the Convento Grande in Lima, uh, and, and, Alvarez and his, had Alvarez and his, his supporters expelled from Macopa's community. The viceroy, however, overturned the expulsion, which technically wasn't allowed to do, and again, the, us, the usurping, powers, uh, gen, usurping powers generally reserved for uh, the order's leadership, and ordered that uh, uh, the election be attended by the intendant of Tarma, Juan Maria Galvez, quote, with an eye to end any discord or dissension that may occur in the election, end of quote. Alvarez and his companions arrived the day of the election in the company of the intendant in a detachment of Spanish regulars out of Jauja. 
As voting began, Carvajal remained firm on the censure that he'd placed on Alvarez and the 15 other members of the Aragonese faction and announced that they would not be allowed to vote. As the voting began, troops filled the room and caused great terror among the friars. Intendant Galvez gave the orders for the troops to present arms. He then read the, to the assembly the December 4th ruling of the viceroy and audiencia and demanded that Alvarez and the other censured missionaries be allowed to vote. Carvajal refused. Galvez repeated the order in the name of the king, but Carvajal again refused. After Galvez gave his ultimatum for a third time, Carvajal silently made a, quote, reverent representation. Frustrated, Galvez commanded the troops to remove Carvajal forcefully, confined to his cell, and prohibited from communi communicating with the other friars. He, there, he died there 10 days later of an unknown illness. <laughs> That's all it says, it was unknown. With Carvajal gone, uh, Galvez instructed the missionaries to select a new president and proceed with the elections. According to one eyewitness, the intendant, quote, ordered his troops to contain the friars even at risk of death, that if they tried to leave the election room or in case they resisted, there would be no other reply than the bullet or the bayonet. They all remained in the room, end of quote. <laughs> the missionaries clearly understood the intendant's message. Uh, after the complex process typical of Franciscan prelate elections in this period, uh, they selected Friar Manuel de Sobriela as guardian and three other members of the Aragonese faction uh, as the discretorio. However, demonstrating a more complex nature of what was going on here, Alvarez himself, though he served as secretary of the election, was not elected to office. He instead stayed for three years to help Sobreviela take control of the college, then chose to return to Spain and collect new missionaries. So uh, kind of complicating this kind of the, the, the black hat uh, uh, image of him. In truth, the election of 1787 um, ushered in a veritable golden age for Copa. Not only were the missionaries now recognized for their piety and good works, but for their embracing of new enlightenment ideals of scientific exploration and commerce. Such good press was typified by a series of articles published, published in the Mercurio Peruano, uh, one of the first intellectual journals in the Americas, uh, which detailed their expeditions into the uncharted frontiers of the empire. With this newfound popularity, the missionaries began a rapid expansion of their missionary enterprise as they received more and more political and material support from the crown. The missionaries did, did have to submit to more oversight from the viceroy, but doing so made it difficult for the viceroy authorities to withhold support as they had done before. In many ways, one could argue that this was the original intent of the Patronato, to get monarchies to buy into the success of the church. The crown jewel of Acopa's new relationship with the state came in 1802, the year that the crown created the Comandancia General de Minas, a province that covered most of the Peruvian Amazon and is roughly the size of continental France. Acopa was given almost exclusive ecclesiastical jurisdiction of the new Comandancia. Furthermore, to streamline Acopa's ability to administer the provinces and parishes, the Comandancia's mastermind of Francisco de Requena uh, urged the crown to push Rome into creating a new diocese that would cover the whole of the province. Requena cautioned, however, that the bishop would have to come from Acopa and suggested that giving, giving the new mitre to uh, Friar Narciso Gibral, one of the college's most experienced missionaries. Indeed, this moment for Acopa most likely was made possible uh, by their change in leadership in 1787 and the consequent strengthening of the Patronato. So uh, in some ways, it seems like it's this horrendous event, but at the same time, it's a complicated uh, situation. However, the selection of the Bishop of Minas demonstrated one of the essential drawbacks to crown support uh, and depending on the Patronato, and that is the goals of the church came second to the goals of the state. In 1803... When the Camara of the Indio, Indies uh, met to consider who the king should select, they unanimously agreed that the first choice should be Gibral. This, in fact, is the, the voting here. And you see in call number one, Friar Narciso Gibral is the unanimous choice of all the members of the Camara of the Indios. Um, the king, or most likely his royal favorite, Manuel de Godoy, however, selected a Franciscan friar in Spain with no connection to a copa. Uh, who declined the position. Uh, I don't think he wanted to go to the jungle. 
The Commodore once again met in 1804 and unanimously recommended Gibral once again. As you can see, he's back in position number one there. Um, and again, the king selected another Franciscan, not from a copa, a friar, Hipotolo Sanchez Rangel. He was in Cuba, and I think re the reasoning whoever selected him was, well, Cuba's hot too, so he won't mind going to the Amazon. Well, no reason is given for, the selection, for not selecting Hibral. One of the most likely, it was most likely that uh, some person or persons within the government feared giving too much power to a copa, again, this, this tension there, and felt that by selecting an outsider, they would be effectively checked. Failure to choose a copa's missionary as a bishop, however, guaranteed the diocese never really got off the ground. And in fact, it was extinguished a couple decades later. Uh, and Rangal and Copa just fought for jurisdiction. But Copa essentially tried to retain their prefect. Uh, and Rangal said, well, the point of having a prefect is that there's no bishop, and now there's a bishop. And they never communicated with each other. They just stopped talking to each other, essentially. Um, and by the time of independence, the diocese had completely disintegrated. And uh, along with the college itself, that had somewhat fallen apart, uh, uh, when Bolivar came in 1824 and personally suppressed a copa, turning it into a public school. So this kind of leaves us with a, 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 a I, I don't know if I conclude a lot in this paper, but I just want to get you to understand the complexity of what's going on here politically. So you have these friars who want the aid of the state, because the state has a lot of money, uh, but that always comes with baggage, and so they're always trying to ride this line between do we take state funding? Do we don't take state funding? Uh, and I really think the conflict that you see between uh, uh, um, the Aragonese faction and the other friars, I, I really like to think that both sides thought they were doing the right thing. Um, and they just saw missionary work differently uh, um, within the empire. And uh, within the, within the ter within, sorry, within the, the proving Amazon. Um, so, uh, I just, I, I just have to conclude that uh, you know, there's a lot more work to be done on this and trying to figure out exactly uh, how the missionaries were able to, to uh, manage um, in a very difficult political situation. Thank you.